I want to welcome you to the second of our contemplative services. Now this service differs from a normal service in that it is designed for you to sit and listen. Not to participate in singing like we usually do, but to practice quiet, silence, listening. These are very important things in the Christian faith and something we don't have a chance to practice very often. So we're going to take a couple of weeks and practice silence. The thing that we'll contemplate this week is the Word of God. And I feel as if my sermons end the same way each and every week. Go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. And you know what? I've decided I'm going to stop apologizing for that. I have a couple of reasons why I think it's perfectly appropriate to end every sermon with a call to God's Word. First, the Word of God is the answer to whatever you're facing. The Word of God doesn't merely have the answer. It is the answer. Many people cried out, Lord, Lord, I'm in trouble. And you know, that's good. The Word of God says that we should do that. But too many of us wait for some miraculous answer when God has already provided it in His Word. Let's read Ephesians 1, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Notice it says, it, God the Father, who has blessed us, has already blessed us. There is nothing we need in our Christian lives that God has not already provided for us. So how has God already blessed us? And you know what? Paul lists a number of things in that passage, but we're going to skip to verse 9. He, God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. God has given us his word. He's given us a revelation of his mystery as a spiritual blessing. We already have that blessing. Second reason why I'm going to stop apologizing for continually exhorting you to go to the word of God is that I will stop doing it when you start doing it, right? I, I will no longer need to tell you to go to the Word of God when I see that you guys are going to the Word of God. And I'm sorry if that sounds offensive. I'm sorry if you feel as if you invest some time in the Word of God and I'm telling you, well, that's not enough. But if you understood what you have in your hands when you have the Word of God, you realize, well, it probably isn't enough, right? Too many of us read the Bible when it's convenient for us, when we have nothing else going on. I don't know of too many Christians that skip doing things that they want to do in life so that they can study the Word of God. But that same word tells us that the kingdom of God is like a treasure buried in a field, and we should sell everything that we have to buy that field. Why? Because the treasure that's in that field is more valuable than everything that we have. Some of you might be thinking, well, you know, Poor peasants in Palestine when the Bible is written, sure, that treasure is worth more than they have. No. This treasure, the Word of God, is more valuable than anything any of us have. It's more valuable than the net worth of Bill Gates, of Jeff Bezos, of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett would actually become a richer man if he sold everything that he had, if he got rid of everything that he had and gained only the Word of God in return. The Word of God reveals to us the kingdom of God and therefore is the treasure worth sacrificing, worth investing in. Others of us, when we read the Word of God, we mine it to find things that support or affirm what we already believe. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, this is a vivid description, and it's not a particularly comfortable description. It's a description of God performing surgery on our lives and on our hearts. And one of the functions of Scripture, according to this verse, is to judge the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. That's supposed to change us. But when was the last time we were reading the Word of God and just threw up our arms and said, Lord, I've been wrong this whole time. Forgive me. 
Yeah, I don't see that happening very often. Now today we're going to examine Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to contemplate the value of the Word of God. Let's contemplate together. Let's think about hearing the word of God. In Numbers chapter 20, Israel was in a bad place. Israel had been wandering around for almost a generation. A lot of the old leaders are dying off. The Israelites were looking to Moses for leadership, and they were disgruntled. They grumbled and complained. And in chapter 20, they were grumbling about water. They didn't have water. So Moses did what he always did. He went to God and ask for water. Let's start reading chapter 20 and verse 6. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock and drink. This is a passage describing the word of the Lord 
coming to Moses. Now let's just pause for a moment and think about how incredible that is in and of itself, that God would speak to us. I feel like a lot of us just kind of assume, well, of course God speaks to us because we're worth it. We're so valuable to God. Yeah, not really. But God chose chose to speak to us anyways. God arranged things so that we could, could experience the glory of God. Now here's a little side note. I find it fascinating that in Exodus, Moses, mankind, could not bear the glory of God, not directly. But if you ever notice, as you go through Scripture, mankind has more and more opportunities to bear the glory of God, to experience the glory of God. And then finally, we have the ability to see God face to face. Why is it that it transitions that way? That's going to be a writing project of mine someday and just something interesting to think about, but let's return to the word of the Lord. After Moses and Aaron experienced the glory of God, then God himself spoke to Moses and Aaron. And even though God spoke in a manner which is intelligible to mankind, God's speech and our speech is still different, right? First, God's speech is effective. God speaks and things happen, right? God said, let there be light, and light was. Light didn't have a choice but to be. I come home from work and say, let there be dinner, and nothing happens. (laughs) So it's curious. I don't understand it. The second reason why God's speech and man's speech are different is that the word of the Lord is actually an extension of his character. God cannot lie. God cannot change. God cannot be anything less than true or holy. Therefore, the words that come from God, that are generated by God, cannot be anything but truth, cannot be anything but holy. It cannot lie. It cannot change. When we speak, when you and I speak, we reflect the sin that's kind of infected our very being. In fact, a lot of us, gain a lot of entertainment out of that fact. My wife and I just finished Homeland Season 7. It's a spy series, right? And 80% of everything that's said in this series is a lie. And it's so entertaining to figure out who is believing what lie. Now, for the record, lying is bad. Uh, Yet, spy movies are awesome. Um, (laughs) There's nothing wrong with spy movies. But it illustrates the fact that when we speak we can lie. God can't do that. He actually has an inability to do that. Think about that. Right? The third reason why God's speech and man's speech are different is that God's words are automatically authoritative. So that when God speaks, we need to listen. When I was in the army and we were given a task to do, privates would squabble amongst each other. Oh, let's do it this way, let's do it this way, blah, blah, blah. When the first sergeant came around, highest enlisted person in a company, and the first sergeant says, do it this way, well, guess what? Privates did it that way. And we serve a God that when he speaks, kings and generals stop to listen. And so should we. You know, this is how things were supposed to go. But as we continue through the story, we realize this is not how it went. Something went wrong. Let us think about applying the word of God. And there's been some confusion around this story, especially the Sunday school version of it. So let's break it down. Go to verse 9. So Moses took his staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Is this really what God asked Moses and Aaron to do? God commanded them to speak to the rock. But instead, Moses struck it. God wanted to provide for the physical needs of his people, but there was something that God wanted even more. God wanted to teach his people a lesson. He wanted to teach them the power of the word of God. But instead of demonstrating the power of God's word, Moses used his own strength. He used the spectacle of his staff. And there's two problems with Moses' action here. First, Moses gave in to our human desire for spectacle, for signs, for wonders. 
Moses was an immensely patient leader. But the grumbling and the complaining overwhelmed him. Moses kind of snapped. He lost his temper. And he lashed out and struck the rock. This is not unlike the episode in the Gospels when the teacher of the law came to Jesus and said, well, uh, Jesus, if you only give us a sign, if you only do us a wonder. Jesus responded, only a wicked generation asks for signs and wonders. Jesus had already performed many miracles among people, but apparently these weren't good enough for the teachers of the law. Or maybe they didn't see it firsthand. They wanted something bigger, but what the teachers of the law didn't realize is that the biggest miracle of all was standing right in front of them. God himself had become man and was talking with them and was talking with the teachers of the law. And you know what? If that miracle isn't big enough for you to believe, no miracle will be big enough for you to believe. But the second problem with Moses' reaction might have been even more serious. Notice what Moses said in response to the grumbling of the, of the Israelites. Listen, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Who was it that brought water out of the rock? Was it Moses? No. Moses went to God and said, God, we need water. And God came up with the solution. Use this rock. Moses succumbed to the problem that many of us faith, face. That we don't think the word of God is enough. When we get in trouble, we pray to the Lord, Lord, give me this, give me that, give me this answer, give me that answer. Oftentimes, God has already given us the answer. God has already provided his word to solve whatever problem we have, but we're either too lazy to do it, or we find that we don't like that answer, we want something different. American Christians today tend to privilege the extraordinary over the ordinary. And to most of us, the Bible is exceedingly ordinary. In fact, I know a lot of Christians that say the Bible is boring, that the Bible is obscure. Churches, when they look for pastors, when I was applying for this position, I read through hundreds of job descriptions. And you'd be shocked at how many of those job descriptions say something like this, that we're looking for a pastor to make the Word of God relevant. Now, I kind of get what they're trying to say there, but the words are unfortunate because they imply that the Word of God isn't already relevant. That the Word of God is great, but it's missing something. It's missing you or I to punch it up to make it more exciting, more effective. That's unfortunate. Moses' story in Numbers 20 had a mixed ending. shepherd is whose goodness faileth never I'm nothing like if I am his and he is mine forever and he is mine forever
my goodness faileth never Good shepherd may I sing your praise Within your house forever Within your house forever All right, let's think about respecting the word of God. So what happened when Moses disobeyed God? Let's turn to verse 11. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rod twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Wait a minute. Moses screwed up. Moses disobeyed God. And yet God provided water anyways. Now there's many Americans that might conclude that the result was the same, so who cares? Right? That it couldn't have been that big of a deal. Moses may not have gotten it done the best way, but it had the same result. So be it, right? We live in a results-driven society, and the results here seem to work out just fine. Everyone got something to drink. Well, yes and no. A couple of different ways of looking at this. God proved himself faithful, even though we are unfaithful. This is the content of the covenant of Genesis 15, that even when we don't live up to our end of the bargain, God still will, because that's who he is. Actually, he can't do otherwise. He cannot change cannot lie. Now, through our behavior, you and I may participate in that promise or not, but God will still be faithful to his promise. Here in Numbers 20, God extended Moses and the Israelites grace and mercy. Now, the newsboys tell us that grace is when we get what we don't deserve and when we, when we don't get what we do deserve. I'm not going to sing it from you, but think about that. When we get what we don't deserve, when we don't get what we do deserve. That is grace. But even with grace, there are still consequences. And here there are two negative consequences for Israel. First, Israel missed out on an opportunity to learn a valuable lesson about the power of God's word. It's clear from the rest of the Bible that not learning this lesson cost Israel big time, tremendous suffering, thousands of deaths didn't have to be. Second, Moses was still not allowed to enter the promised land. You know, forgiveness of sin doesn't always mean the elimination of all consequences, right? This is why it's perfectly acceptable to send a converted serial killer to jail for the rest of his life. He may be declared not guilty by the work of Jesus, but he can still pay for his crimes. The word of God is powerful and effective and we take things in our own hands at our own risks. The word of God is one of the most miraculous things you will ever encounter. The Bible is made up of 66 different books. It has 40 different authors written over 1,500 years. It's written on three continents and in three languages and yet it has a single unified message. Nothing else like it in the entire world. The more you learn how that this book came to us, the more you will be confident in its divine origins. The more you learn what this book says to us, the better equipped you'll be to face whatever situation you can come in contact with. This book isn't merely an historical record about Christ. This book is Christ. The Apostle John tells us in the first chapter, actually the first verse of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That verb there was in Greek is kind of like a grammatical equal sign, that the Word equals God, God equals the Word. How many times have we prayed to sense the presence of Christ, and yet the Bible is right next to us and we never cracked it open? How many of us have prayed for God to give us an answer? And that book stayed closed on our nightstand. How many times have we prayed for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and yet we never turned to the Word of God? Remember, according to Ephesians 1, God has already given us every spiritual blessing. The Word of God is remarkable. There's nothing like it. Because it is the words that come from God. Let's pray. Lord, may we never abandon the quest to 
dig deeper into your word. May we never give up on learning about you, of understanding you deeper and deeper. And Lord, whenever we're in trouble, I pray that you develop within us the habit of going to your word. Lord, you've provided other ways in which to connect with us. But at the end of every one of those paths is your word. I pray that we go there by the most direct means possible. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you.